I sometimes read uh, public domain books here on Leaves of Glen. And they were written a long time ago, uh, so they're usually uh, racist or sexist or bigoted. Uh, But in there somewhere and all that is a a story, and that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read uh, works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist, but they might have adult language or adult situations. So that's your warning, uh, but I'm sure you uh, are grown up enough to handle it don't write to me complaining I got nothing as far as updates go life stays exactly the same day after day when you are trapped in your home uh I feel like I should start making diary entries for my openings like day 7 I know that the cats love buttons they're always looking at the buttons on my shirt or my pants, they, they glare at them, desiring and needy, lustfully. So I've started taking all my buttons and hiding them in a certain closet in the hallway. And I've been watching, and I think that they're on to me. But that's about it. I got nothing else. So let's dive into the story. Virginia Woolf was a famous person, uh, and... She was sort of taken up by the feminist movement in the 1970s. So this will be a nice, uh, refreshing departure uh, from my last book, Love Story, which was so sexist. Uh, She was born in 1882 and died in 1941. Um, She lived a life where the people that she loved, her father, her mother, and her sister, uh, all died of various things. And so the poor lady had multiple breakdowns, but she wrote prolific things, and uh, started up her own publishing company with her her husband. Uh, Her father actually inspired her to start writing professionally, and uh, who would have known that, well, her father would have known that she would do so well. So, uh, this is a short story uh, called A Haunted House that we're going to read. It'll be nice and short, and uh, it'll give you a little taste for Virginia Woolf if you've never heard of her. Which would be weird if you hadn't. And uh, maybe you go read some of the other things she's written. Um, so enjoy. A Haunted House by Virginia Woolf. Published in 1921. Whatever hour you woke, there was a door shutting. From room to room they went, hand in hand, lifting here, opening there, making sure that ghostly couple. Here we left it, she said, and added, Oh, but here too. It's upstairs, she murmured, and in the garden, she whispered, quietly, they said, or we shall wake them. But it wasn't that you woke us, oh no, they're looking for it, they're drawing the curtain, one might say, and so read on a page or two, now they found it. One would be certain, stopping the pencil on the margin, and then, tired of reading, one might rise and see for oneself the house all empty, the doors standing open, only the wood pigeons bubbling, with the content and the hum of the threshing machine sounding from the farm. Uh, What did I come in here for? What did I want to find? My hands were empty. Perhaps upstairs, then? The apples in the loft. And so down again, the garden still as ever. Only the book had slipped into the grass. But they found it in the drawing room. Not that one could ever see them. The window panes reflected apples, reflected roses. All the leaves were green in the glass. If they moved in the drawing room, the apple only turned its yellow side. Yet the moment after, if the door was open, spread about the floor, hung upon the walls, pendant from the ceiling, what? My hands were empty. The shadow of a thrush crossed the carpet. From the deepest wells of silence, the wood pigeon drew its bubble of sound. Safe, safe, safe. The pulse of the house beat softly. The buried treasure, the room, the pulse stopped short. Oh, was that the buried treasure? A moment later the light had faded out in the garden then, but the trees spun darkness for a wandering beam of sun. So 
fine, so rare, coolly sunk beneath the surface of the beam. I saw it always burnt behind the glass. Death was the glass. Death was between us. Coming to the woman first, hundreds of years ago, leaving the house, sealing all the windows, the rooms were darkened. He left it, left her, went north, went east, saw the stars turn into the southern sky, sought the house, found it, dropped beneath the downs. Safe, safe, safe. The pulse of the house beat gladly. The treasure yours. The wind roars up the avenue. Trees stoop and bend this way and that. Moonbeams splash and spill wildly in the rain. But the beam of the lamp falls straight from the window. A candle burns ah, stiff and still. Wandering through the house, opening the windows, whispering. Not to wake us, the ghostly couple seek their joy. Here we slept, she says. And he adds, kisses without number. Wake up in the morning. Silver between the trees. Upstairs. In the garden. When summer came. In winter snow time. The doors go shutting far in the distance, gently knocking like the pulse of a heart. Nearer they came. Cease at the doorway. The wind falls. The rain slides silver down the glass. Our eyes darken. We hear no steps beside us. We see no lady spread her ghostly cloak. Her hands shield the lantern. Look, he breathes, sound asleep. Love upon their lips. Stooping, holding their silver lamp above us. Long they look and deeply, long they pause. The wind drives straightly. The flames stoop slightly. Wild beams of moonlight cross both floor and wall, and, meeting, stain their faces bent. The faces pondering, the faces that search the sleepers and seek their hidden joy. Safe, 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 the heart of the house beats proudly. Long years, he sighs. Again you found me here, she murmurs, sleeping, in the garden, reading, laughing, rolling apples in the loft. Here we left our treasure, stooping, their light lifts the lid upon my eyes. Safe, 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 exclamation point. The pulse of the house beats wildly. Waking, I cry, oh, is this your buried treasure? The light in the heart. Well, that went a lot quicker than I thought it would be. Uh, that was only seven minutes. So I'm going to throw in another story called The Mark on the Wall by Virginia Woolf. From the collection of short stories, Monday or Tuesday which uh, the haunted house also came from. So let's begin. The mark on the wall. Perhaps it was the middle of January in the present year that I first looked up and saw the mark on the wall. In order to fix a date, it is necessary to remember what one saw. So now I think of the fire, the steady film of yellow light upon the page of my book, the three chrysanthemums uh, yeah, in the round glass bowl in the mantelpiece. Yes, it must have been the winter time. And we had just finished our tea, for I remember that I was smoking a cigarette when I looked up and saw the mark on the wall for the first time. I looked up through the smoke of my cigarette, uh, and my eye lodged for a moment upon the burning coals and that old fancy of crimson flag flapping from the castle tower came into my mind, and I thought of the cavalcade of uh, red knights riding up the side of a black rock. Wow, I never had that experience when smoking cigarettes back when I used to do that. Rather to my relief, the sight of the mark interrupted my fancy, for it is an old fancy, an automatic fancy, made as a child, perhaps. The mark was a yeah, small round mark, uh, black upon the white wall, about uh, six or seven inches of the man piece. How readily our thoughts swarm upon a new object, lifting it a little way as ants carry a blade of straw so feverishly, and then uh, leave it. If that mark was made by a nail, it can't have been for a picture. It must have been for a miniature, a miniature of a lady with white powdered curls, powder-dusted cheeks and lips like red carnations. A fraud, of course, for the people who had this house before us would have chosen pictures in that way. 
Eh, an old picture for an old room. That is the sort of people they were. Very interesting people. And I think of them so often in such queer places, but because one never sees them again, uh, never to know what happened next. They wanted to leave this house because they wanted to change their style of furniture. So he said. Ned was in the process of saying that, in his opinion, an art should have ideas behind it. Uh, when we were torn asunder, as one is torn from an old lady about to pour tea uh, and the young man about to hit the tennis ball in the back garden of the suburban villa as one rushes past in the rain. But as for that mark, I'm not sure about it. I don't believe it was made by a nail after all. It was too big, too round for that. I might get up, eh, but if I got up and looked at it, ten to one, I shouldn't be able to say for certain. Because once the thing's done, no one ever knows how it happened. Oh, ah, exclamation point, dear me, the mystery of life. Ah, the inaccuracy of thought, exclamation point. The ignorance of humanity, exclamation point. To show how very little control of our possessions we have, what an accidental affair this living is after all our civilization. Let me just count over a few things lost in one lifetime. Beginning, for what seems always the most mysterious of losses, yeah, what cat would gnaw, what rat would nibble, and yeah, three pair of pale blue canisters of bookbinding tools. Then there's the bird cages, the iron hoops, the steel skates, the Queen Anne coal scuttle, the bagatelle board. Not looking that up. The hand organ, all gone, and jewels too. Opals, ah, and emeralds. Ah, they lay a, lay about at roots and turnips. What a scraping! Pairing affair it is to be sure. The wonder is that I have any clothes on my back, that I sit surrounded by solid furniture at this moment. Why, if one wants to compare life to anything, one must liken it to being blown through the tube <laughs> at 50 miles per hour, landing at the other end without a single hairpin in one's hair, shot out at the feet of God entirely naked, tumbling head over heels in the af uh, asphodel as. Okay, well, I guess I gotta look this one up. Asphodel. Asphodel. Uh, got entirely naked. Tumbling head over heels in the asphodel meadows. Like brown paper parcels. Pitched down a chute in the post office! Exclamation point. With one's hair flying back like the tail of a racehorse. Yes! That seems to express the rapidity of life, the perpetual waste and repair. Also casual, also haphazard. But after life, eh, the plow pulling down a thick green stalk so that the cup of flour, as it turns over, deluges one of the purple and red light. Why, after all, eh, should one not be born there as one is born here, helpless and speechless, unable to focus one's eyesight, groping at the roots of the grass, at the toes of the giants? As for saying which are trees and which are men and women or whether there are such things that one won't be in a condition to do for fifty years or so. There will be nothing but spaces of light and dark, intersected ah, by thick stalks, and rather high up, uh, perhaps rose-shaped blots of indistinct color, dim pinks and blues, which will, as time goes on, become more definite, become, uh, I don't know what, four dots, and yet that mark on the wall is not a hole at all. It may even be caused by some round black substance, such as a small rose leaf left over from the ass summer. And I, not being very vigilant housekeeper, look at the dust on a mailpiece, for example, the dust which, so they say, buried Troy three times over, only fragments of pots utterly refusing annihilation, as one can believe. Yeah, the tree outside the window taps very gently on the pane. Four dots. I want to think quietly, calmly, spaciously, never to be interrupted, never to have her eyes from my chair, to slip easily from one thing to another without any sense of hostility or obstacle. I want to sink deeper, ah, and deeper, away from the surface, with its hard, separate facts, to steady myself. Let me catch hold of the first idea that passes. Shakespeare. Well, he would do as well as another. A man who sat himself solidly uh, in an armchair and looked into the fire, so a shower of ideas fell perpetually from some very high heaven. 
down through his mind. He leant his forehead on his hand, and people looking in through the open door. For this scene is supposed to take place on a summer's evening. But how dull this is. This historical fiction, exclamation point, it doesn't interest me at all. I wish I could hit upon a pleasant track of thought, a track indirectly reflecting credit upon myself. For those are the unpleasantest thoughts. Oops, just pleasantest thoughts, not unpleasantest thoughts. And very frequent, even in the minds of modest, mouse-colored people. You believe genuinely that they dislike to hear their own phrases. They are not thoughts directly praising oneself. That is the beauty of them. They are thoughts like this. Quote, And then I came into the room. They were discussing botany. I said how I'd seen a flower growing in a dust heap on the site of an old house in Kingsway. The seed, I said, must have been sown in the reign of Charles I. What flowers grew in the Reign of Charles I, I asked, but I don't remember the answer. Tall flowers, ah, with purple tassels uh, to them, perhaps. And so it goes on. All the time I'm dressing up the figure of myself, my own mind, lovingly, stealthily, not openly adoring it. Uh, for if I did that, I should catch myself out and stretch my hand at once for a book in self-protection. Indeed, it is curious how instinctively one protects the image of oneself from idolatry or any other handling that can make it ridiculous, or too unlike the original to be believed any longer. Or, it is not so very curious after all, eh, question mark. It is a matter of great importance. But suppose the looking glass smashes, the image disappears, and romantic figure with the green and forced depths all about it is there no longer. But only the shell of a person which is seen by other people. Ah, what an airless, shallow, bald, prominent world it becomes. A world now to be lived in. As we face each other in omnibuses and underground railways, we are looking into the mirror that accounts for the vagueness, the gleam of glassiness in our eyes. And the novelists in the future will realize more and more the importance of these reflections, for, of course, there is not one reflection, but an almost infinite number. Those are the depths they will explore, those the phantoms they will pursue, leaving the description of reality more and more out of the stories, taking a knowledge of it for granted, as the Greeks did, and Shakespeare perhaps. But these generalizations are eh, very worthless. The military sound of the word is enough. It recalls uh, leading articles, cabinet ministers, a whole class of things, indeed, which, as a child, one thought the thing itself, the standard thing, the real thing, from which one could not depart save at the risk of nameless damnation. Generalizations bring back somehow Sunday in London, Sunday afternoon walks, Sunday luncheons, and also ways of speaking of the dead, clothes, and habits, like the habit of sitting all together in one room until a certain hour. Although nobody liked it. There was a rule for everything, the rule for tablecloths at the particular period, was what they should uh, be made of tapestry with little yellow compartments uh, marked upon them. You see the photographs of the carpets of the corridors of the world. Tablecloths of a different kind were not real tablecloths. Oh, how shocking. And yet how wonderful it was to discover that these real things, Sunday luncheons, with Sunday walks, country houses, uh, and tablecloths, they were not entirely real were indeed half phantoms, and the damnation which visited the disbeliever in them was only a sense of illegitimate freedom. And now takes the place of those, those things, I wonder, those real standard things. Eh, men, perhaps, should you be a woman. The masculine point of view, which governs our lives, which sets the standard, which establishes Whitaker's table of precedency, which has become, I suppose, since the war, half a phantom to many men and women, which soon, one may hope, will be laughed into the dustbin where the phantoms go, the mahogany, sideboards, and the landseer prints, gods and devils, hell and so forth, leaving us all in an intoxicating sense of illegitimate freedom, if freedom exists, for dots. Certain lights of the mark of the wall seems actually to point eh, from the wall, nor is it entirely circular. I cannot be sure, but it seems to cast a perceptible shadow, suggesting that if I ran my finger down that strip of the wall, it would, at a certain point, eh, mount and descend, 
small tumulus, a uh, smooth tumulus, like the, those barrows on the South Downs, which are, eh, they say, either tombs or camps. Of the two, I should prefer them to be tombs, desiring melancholy like most English people, and finding it natural at the end of a walk to think of the bones stretched beneath the turf. There must be some book about it, some antiquary. Must have dug up those bones and given them a name. What sort of man? As an antiquary, I wonder. Hey, retired uh, colonels, for the most part, I dare say, leading parties of aged laborers to the top here, examining clods of earth and stone, and getting into correspondence with neighboring clergy, which, being opened at breakfast time, gives them a feeling of importance. Eh, the comparison of arrowheads necessitates cross-country journeys to the country towns, an agreeable necessity uh, both to them and their elderly wives, to, who wish to make plum jam or to clean out the study and to have every reason for keeping that great question of the camp or the tomb in perpetual suspension, while the uh, colonel himself feels agreeably philosophic in accumulating evidence on both sides of the question, it is true uh, that he does finally incline to believe that camp, eh, and being opposed, indicts a pamphlet, which he is about to read at the quarterly meeting, the local society, who in a stroke lays him low in his last conscious thoughts, eh, not of his wife or child, but of camp and arrowhead there, which is now in the case of the local museum, together with the foot of a Chinese murderess, <laughs> a handful of Elizabethan nails, uh, Great many Tudor uh, clay pipes, a piece of Roman pottery, uh, and the wine glass that Nelson drank out of. Proving I don't really know what. Feeling the ignorant folly of never reading over a story before I record it for my podcast, I continue to read on. No, no, nothing is proved, nothing is known, and if I were to get up at this very moment and ascertain that the mark on the wall is really, eh, what shall we say, the head of a gigantic old nail driven in 200 years ago, which has now, owing to the patent, uh, patent attrition of the many generations of housemaids, revealed its head above the coat of paint and is taking its first view of modern life in the sight of a white-walled, fire-lit room. What should I gain? Uh, knowledge? Question mark? Matter for further speculation? Another question mark. I can think sitting still as well as standing up, and what is knowledge? What are learned men save the descendants of witches and hermits who crouched in caves and woods, brewing herbs, interrogating eh, shrew mice, and writing down the language of the stars? And the less we honor them as our superstitions dwindle and our respect for beauty and health. Of mine increases, yes, one could imagine a very pleasant world, a quiet, spacious world, with the flowers so red and blue in the open fields, a world without professors or specialists or housekeepers with their profiles of policemen, a world uh, which one could slice with one's thought as a fish slices the water with fin, grazing the stems of the water lilies, hanging suspended over nests of white sea eggs for dots. How peaceful it is down there, rooted in the center of the world, and gazing up through the gray waters with their sudden gleams of light, their reflections, if it were not for Whitaker's Almanac, if it were not for the table of precedency, I must jump up and see for myself what the mark on the wall really is, a nail, a ah, rose leaf, a crack in the wood, <laughs> here is nature once more, a matter old game of self-preservation. This train of thought, she perceives, this threatening mere waste of energy, even some collision with reality. Uh, who will ever be able to lift a finer uh, finger Sorry, against Whitaker's table of precedence? The Archbishop of Canterbury is followed by Lord High Chancellor. The Lord High Chancellor is followed by the Archbishop of York. Everybody follows somebody, which is the philosophy of Whitaker. And the great thing is to know who follows whom. Whitaker knows, and let that so nature consoles comfort you, instead of enraging you. And if you can't be comforted, if you must shatter this hour of peace, think of the mark on the wall. I understand nature's game, <laughs> her prompting to take action as a way of ending any thought that threatens to excite or pain. Hence, I suppose, comes our slight contempt for men of action. Men, we assume, who don't think, 
Still, there's no harm in putting a full stop to one's disagreeable thoughts by looking at the mark on the wall. Indeed, now I have fixed my eyes upon it. I feel that I have grasped a plank in the sea. I feel satisfying sense uh, of reality, which at once turns the two archbishops and the Lord High Chancellor to the shadows of shades. Here is something definite, something real. Thus, waking from a midnight dream of horror, one hastily turns on the light ah, and lies quiescent, worshipping the chest of drawers, worshipping solidity, worshipping reality, worshipping the impersonal world, which is the proof of some existence other than ours. That is what we, or what one wants to be sure of, four dots. Wood is a pleasant thing to think about. Eh, it sure is. If it comes from a tree, trees grow, and we don't know how they grow. For years and years they grow, uh, without paying attention to us. In meadows, uh, forests, uh, by the side of rivers. All things one likes to think about. The cows swish their tails beneath them on hot afternoons. They paint rivers so green that when the moorhen, whatever that is, and not looking it up, dives, one expects to see its feathers all green. Uh, when it comes up again, I like to think of the fish balanced against the stream like flags blown out. And a water beetle slowly rising domes of mud upon the bed of a river. I like to think of the tree itself. Yeah, first the close dry sensation of being wood, then the grinding of the storm, then the slow, yeah, delicious ooze of sap. I like to think of it, too, on a winter's night, yeah, standing in the empty field with all the leaves close furled. Nothing tender exposed to the iron bullets of the moon, a naked mast upon the earth. It goes tumbling, tumbling all night long. The song of birds must sound very loud and strange in June. And how cold the feet of insects must feel upon it. They make their laborious progress up the creases of the bark or sun themselves upon the thin yeah, green awning of the leaves and look straight in front of them with diamond-cut eyes. One by the fibers snap beneath the immense cold pressure of the earth, and then the last storm comes in, falling, and yeah, the highest branches drive deep into the ground again. Even so... Life isn't done with. Uh, there are a million patent, patient, uh, watchful lives still for a tree all over the world. Uh, in bedrooms and ships and on pavement, lining rooms where men and women sit after tea, smoking cigarettes. It's full of peaceful thoughts. Uh, happy thoughts, this tree. I should like to take each one separately. Uh, but something's getting in the way. Four dots. Where was I? Question mark. What has it been all about? Question mark. A tree? Question mark. A river? Question mark. The downs? Question mark. Whitaker's Almanac? Question mark. The fields of uh, Esfotl? I already looked that up. I'm not going to repronounce that again. I can't remember a thing. Everything's moving, falling, slipping, vanishing. There is a vast upheaval of matter. Someone is standing over me and saying, I'm going out to buy a newspaper. Uh, yes? Though it's no good buying newspapers, nothing ever happens. Curse the war. God damn this war. All the same, I don't see why we should have a snail on our wall. Oh, the mark on the wall. Yeah, <laughs> it's a snail. Well, there you have it. I read two stories by Virginia Woolf. She's known as being uh, sort of the innovator of a sort of stream of consciousness style of writing, which, when reading it quietly to yourself and not out loud, is probably very enjoyable. I could see how I could enjoy it if I wasn't reading it out loud. As the guy reading it out loud, the experience kind of stunk, so it was very difficult and hard to read. Uh, the first one, Haunted House. Uh, there's a young couple living in a house that happens to be haunted by a dead couple. Presumably old. Uh, they got a secret, and the house beats like a heart, and that secret is love. So there's that. Uh, pretty abstract. I could have gotten that totally wrong. It was so, uh, kind of all over the place stream of consciousness style that I wasn't really exactly keeping up as I was reading it. Next story. Uh, basically, the woman sees a spot on the wall. It's kind of a weird spot. She can't tell if it's 
flat or if it's 3D and poking out with a shadow. She can't tell, and it sends her into an entire uh, stream of consciousness, collection of thoughts all over the place before apparently her husband comes in saying he's going to get the paper and goes, ah, there's a snail on the wall. Then she realizes, oh, all the thoughts I've been having around this thing on the wall that's inspired an entire litany of things is just a snail. And she's satisfied with that. I'm not satisfied with that. If I had a snail on the wall inside my house, I would be creeped out. Much like if I had a snake in my basement, I would be thoroughly creeped out. Those things shouldn't be in your house at any point. Unless you're in the habit of keeping your windows and doors wide open with no screens or anything and all sorts of animals are just coming in. At that point, do you live in a house or should you just live in a cave with no doors? Because anything can come in and make itself at home. Uh, One time I went uh, to Mexico and stayed at a resort, which was weird and I wish I didn't go, but uh, I did. And there was a gecko inside the uh, hotel thing I was staying at. It's just a lizard, just there in the house, next to our food. And I thought that was odd. Get the hell out. So, if anything can be learned from today's episode is nothing happens when you're in quarantine and uh, don't ever leave your doors open so that random animals come live in your house. Because then why bother living in a house? Thanks for listening.